Thank you very much, Mom Dang. Thank you. Good morning, every. Uh, good morning, everyone. Let me turn on my camera so everyone I can greet everyone properly. Hello, can you see me? Hold on one second. There you go. Yes, sir. I can see you, sir. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. Thank you very much for having the time and joining today's session. Thank you as well for the team of De La Salle University Das Marinas, particularly CILP, uh, for the chance to address all of you guys this morning. Uh, I hope everyone has a cup of coffee and uh, we're all good to go. Um, let me go ahead and start sharing my slides. That way, good morning, Sir Roland. Hi, sir. Good morning. Been a while, sir. Hope everyone's uh, uh, nice and safe and uh, for your family as well. You know, amidst the current situation that we have, I think this is uh, this is going to be our new norm. So everyone's really going to start levering on uh, leveraging on technology to be able to do a lot of the learning we have. So, uh, and the majority of the audience that we have, sir, today are educators as well. Is that right? Yes. Teachers, okay. All right. Sharing my screen, so we got something visual. All right. Everyone can see the, the screen. Yes. Okay, great. So the topic is leveraging technology tools to maximize learning. Um, and thank you, Mamdang, for the. Very nice introduction. Basically, I'm speaking from my group, CloudSwift, right now. We are a regional uh, education ISV and learning partner of Microsoft. Uh, it is a mouthful, but basically, we, we're, we're very much geared towards education. And uh, usually, when I start the discussion or when I start every webinar, I, I'd like to kind of give an idea or give the audience an idea of current situations and, and what's going on right now and kind of just move towards the topic. Um, so this very beginning is uh, very much used along multiple um, webinars that you've probably seen already. But just to reiterate, there is a huge gap in the SAN technology skills, uh, especially for workplace. 47% of today's jobs will be redefined in 20 years. You've heard that multiple times, but that num that those the, those number of years is starting to to close down, right? It's it's we're we're already at that point. 65% of the students that you teach today will be doing jobs that don't yet exist. So you might be familiar or you might have heard a lot about new terms such as business intelligence consultants or robotics process automation engineers and uh, uh, artificial intelligence engineers, uh, machine learning uh, architects. So these things, these titles, they didn't exist three to five years ago. But now they're norms and they're the type of uh, job titles that your your students will be will be uh, having in a couple of years from now. For um, majority of the uh, corporations and industries also view online learning as very beneficial, very beneficial to career progression. They're now seeing a, uh, online learning as a way to, for them to still be able to be abreast of current topics and still be in line with the with new technologies as they go. But what I want to focus is here, 87% of higher education leaders, you guys uh, in Asia believe that there is a need for a digital institution to succeed. I'd like to emphasize on word, it's a need. It's no longer a want. It's no longer a desire for, for, for people to just want have, to have um, e-learning as a method uh, to transition or to integrate within their classes. It's already right there, right? Um, especially now uh, with, uh, with the current uh, uh, global pandemic still on a rise, although we are seeing, you know, there's a very positive thing after a while. We are seeing, uh, especially for the Philippines, that we're starting to flatten the curve. So that, that was some uh, that was good news to hear from DOH, but that becomes a need. And um, a lot of the schools, especially with uh, uh, La Salle, is that you guys are, are, are already here. You're very much one of the forefronts. Um, and you guys are the template when it comes to digital learning. So that's that's really nice. To give you the view of the trends across the whole of Southeast Asia, on the left-hand side, you will see the technologies that are predominantly on the rise. 
Uh, and you know, a lot of this, if you've attended any technology talks or any Microsoft webinar, you've, you've heard them rehash over and over. Data and artificial uh, intelligence, uh, system automation, DevOps. Now, gesture recognition technology is also uh, a huge uh, interest across Southeast Asia. Actually, if you look at the heat map on the right, you would see that in the Philippines, there is a heavy proliferation of uh, humanized technology. Rank one on our trends when it comes to um, when it comes to technology, social media marketing. You know, and, and it's a funny thing that we joke about. The moment that um, everyone was in in uh, quarantine, everyone there was a huge spike in the upload of or in the download of social media applications and uh, Instagram and TikTok and all of these other things that el enables still some kind of social interaction of users. Uh, even though they're they're in the comforts of their home own homes and the safety of their own homes, next is front end web development. Basically, to 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 put it down in its very very base details, user interaction and user experience. We want to be able to give a more humanized approach on how do you the, on the way that you do things, right? And and this is very evident on on most technologies that you use. You want something that's easy to use and very intuitive. Uh, and lastly, human centered design. Why human-centered design? Well, technology needs to be able to bend together with how you do things, right? Um, there is a there is a term that we, that that's currently on uh, being used now that the that that uh, students are very much uh, digital. They're physically adapted to the digital technologies that they have. So there's no more lines. That's already very blurred. Um, on what they use, it's it's second nature for them to pick up their phone, look at something, be able to move around, and that that all goes towards human-centered design. So where does that bring us? Actually, we are at an intersection, right? Challenge is that people are feeling connected to technology. We're do, we're we're using it every day. It's on everything that we do. It's very much like I said, second nature for us. But we're still at a point where, and it's still very manual. Right, uh, and uh, it's very uh, and and for a lot of um, a lot of uh, students, it's still a bit labor intensive when they're using applications, when they're using new technologies. They still feel kind of lost, and everything needs to be manually enabled for them to move move forward with things. And um, that's slowly changing, yes, but there's still there's still that point. It's kind of like when you're when you're at a at a stoplight and we're, you're waiting for a go signal, right? You're waiting for that go signal for you to be able to cross the street. Uh, and that stoplight that we're seeing is basically uh, digital transformation waiting at us, staring and blinking, say, hey, come on, cross over, we're, we're ready for you. Uh, and digital technology is something that's been on everyone's mouth for, I think, five, three, five years now, <laughs> all, of the, all of the webinars and all of the, uh, all of the events that I've gone, gone to usually talks about some kind of digital transformation but you know sort of the 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 the, the tongue-in-cheek joke about the current norm is that when you ask companies now who is your biggest uh, driver of digital transformation is it the ceo no is it the uh, learning and development manager not really it's actually the 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 pandemic that drove everyone to digital transformation and they're kind of forced into it and there was a mad scramble about two two months ago for a lot of companies that weren't as ready yet in order to be able to transition so everyone drove towards transformation um but you know that that's kind of a that's kind of a light job at the situation just the way to think about it and uh, apart from digital transformation everyone's talking about industrial revolution right this is again very much about what we're doing now. Throw it back, 1780, the first one was about steam. It was about the, the, the locomotives. It was about being able to, tra uh, to, tra to, to transfer location from large span of uh, lands to be able to move from one state to another, to be able to co go cross country using different types of, uh, types of trains or cargo. Uh, and that moved up, uh, that moved uh, the, the whole uh, civilization thrust forward. It was a major, as they said, industrial revolution. Fast forward a hundred years later, we've got electricity coming in and mass production began. We are now able to provide uh, different kinds of uh, uh, machineries and uh, factories that uh, is able to do different um, 
production lines for both food, manufacturing, parts, and now also we're able to identify different types of divisions of labor. A couple of years back, and a, a few of you would still remember this, is when there was a giant boom for electronics back in 1970s, right? Automated production and the production, the production line then got much more polished so that it's much easier for us to develop new electronics. This is the time where a tiny company such as Japan then rose into prominence and become a, became a world leader. And there are still all of those uh, brands that are still tech giants or electronic giants today, such as um, Sony, Sanyo, Hitachi, all of those are still very much available and flourishing as companies now. And today we've got the cyber physical systems that allows us to connect through everything. We are able to now move from laptop to phones to be able to go into your TVs and look at that. I mean, the easiest way for you to do that is just to uh, look at how you're using Netflix, right? You're coming from your phone, but when you get tired of your phone, you move on to the big screen so that everyone can enjoy. Same goes if, for example, if you're looking at uh, different types of uh, information, you can just stream them uh, and, and move it over to different, uh, different uh, terminals, different devices. So everything is connected into one giant network, uh, especially with technology nowadays. But I want you to take a look at how change is being forced as well. And this, this picture is a good example of that. Um, I'd, like to uh, I'd like to ask you to spend a couple of seconds to identify what the difference is be between these two images. On the left-hand side, this is the same location, by the way. Uh, there's the Flatiron Building. Uh, a few of you, that's a, that's a landmark, actually. Uh, and a few of you would uh, be familiar with that. On the left-hand side, you've got progress. As you can see, you've got people moving about in their ways, going to, to, to their offices or going to work. And on the right-hand side, just fast forward 20 years later, you've got the biggest change, uh, or you, you're seeing a big change. So you've got horse-drawn carriages on the left, and you've got automobiles on the right. So a lot of you would say that, that the biggest change is, yes, there's more cars. Yep, there's more people, definitely, because they're much more mobile. But there's also one big change here. On the left-hand side, you'd see that these horse-drawn carriages are well. They're 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 um, they're creatures of labor, right? Or that they were they they were functional and they were critical to the way that the society was moving at the moment. But at the same time, it also supported a very large workforce that existed during that time. There were people that were cleaning up after the carriages, after the horses. There were the horse cart drivers. Um, there were the shovelers that basically made sure that the streets were very clean and that they didn't have any. Any, any, uh, you know, any bacteria or anything that might be able to cause, uh, you know, uh, uh, a biologic uh, concern for the city or for the town. Just 20 years after that short span of time, it was only 20 years when the automobiles were interest uh, were were introduced and they, you know, they exploded into view. That whole industry and that whole workforce that were cleaning up after the horses that was gone. It was, in, you know, it was a radical change for them to be to move those people that were working uh, on that workforce to be able to do other jobs. If you're a horse cart driver before, you might be a car, uh, you might or might not be an automobile driver now, uh, and so you have to look at different ways. And now, because of technology, change is actually being enforced for everyone. And we're part of that change now. From the physical side, you've got autonomous vehicles. Um, you very much have seen that Minority Report uh, movie wherein Tom Cruise was jumping in a highway and all of the cars were self-driven. So that's actually a reality now because of the way uh, in a lot, of, uh, a lot of countries, farther developed countries, they can actually have uh, uh, autonomous vehicles. Um, in Japan and in uh, Australia, they're testing autonomous vehicles that cleans uh, the roads and at the same time autonomous stores wherein they, were, uh, they, they have vending machines on specific paths. Uh, of course, you've got the robotic arms from production and 3D printers that allow you to use your imagination to be able to create not just small parts, but even large components, uh, such as that little flower vase that you're seeing there. Next, you've got the biological um, uh, uh, changes, right? <clears throat> We've got genomic diagnostics. You see this picture right here, where in there's two doctors. Just a couple of years back, maybe 10, 12 years back, that was a whole operating theater with multiple doctors present inside. 
probably a couple of different nurses and a couple of different medical technicians, but instead you now have two medical professionals working with various robotic arms that are doing precision work on that, uh, on that operation. And then there's the en uh, enablement of, of uh, people, right? It used to be that if you lose a leg, all you'd need, to, all you'd have is a is a, a walker or a cane. But now these uh, technology allows us to be able to give them um, freedom of mobility and movement back up. Uh, Historius, uh, who was a marathon runner, was even without legs. So that gives you an idea on how that works. And on the bottom is actually a picture that I captured from. Uh, this, this is actually a LSL picture, uh, and it's a, it's a giant leap forward in terms of. Uh, research and development and engineering, medical engineering. Lastly, we have the digital side. And again, IoT, blockchain, AI, big data, cloud computing, common terms nowadays that you hear. Uh, but some of the applications in agriculture, IoT very much works towards keeping production in agriculture at its uh, topmost um, or most optimum uh, state. You've got a solar panel then and, and, and a control that basically can, uh, that, that manages uh, water, temperature, irrigation, all of that. And on the very bottom, you'd see uh, how AI is currently being uh, used nowadays. Um, imagine a very busy street, you'd be able to identify um, heat spots or potential threats. You can see there's an abandoned object, there's loitering, or if, for example, even for the very simplest kind that if there is a lost child moving into information, all that child needs to say is, um, what does your mother look like? And this this capture, this this AI can automatically filter down possible people from a huge number of uh, of, of bystanders and uh, people, foot traffic inside that very busy airport. So it gives you a little bit of idea of how that uh, AI is being used in the uh, in the industry now. But we're going to focus on three main areas. We've got big data, cloud processing, and machine learning or AI. Data is the new oil. That's very much. Uh, a, a, a term that's common nowadays that's being used uh, and, and really just like oil um, here's one one easy way to to see that just like oil oil is very much useless just like any data it can be floating around anything that we do any keystroke that we make on the computer any search uh, or any input that we provide over a massive uh, database just floats as random data right it, you can you can liken it to flotsam and jetsam on on a wreckage, but unless that data is refined and processed and applied, then it becomes something that's useful. Just like oil, oil in its bare state, very, very pretty much has no purpose, right? But when you refine it, process it, it then becomes all of the things that moves the machineries that we have in today's industry. Analytics, when applied to data, begins to create some form of information that is done become usable for you to apply into business decisions. And this transition is just an easy way for you or visual way for you to see how that works. Analytics is then becomes becomes the rules and, uh, and, and processes that sorts out all of that information by providing a few lines of code, by putting together a few types of information to, 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 to capture the, the, the relevant information and then align it, you then can make business critical decisions. Next, we move on to storage and power. Um, <laughs> there's a funny, uh, a, a funny picture. This is a one megabyte uh, hard drive at the time. And as you can see, the image, it needs to be loaded on a pallet jack. And four to six people can easily fit inside that big box. That's one MB. Just 30 years, less than 30 years, fast forward. You guys still remember floppy disks? I remember when I was studying. Um, I was seven, I think, and I was still using those uh, standard floppy disks and disk and the big ones, the five point, the five point sevens uh, that was big enough for you to use as a fan, and it was actually very flimsy. Basically, the capacity is the same, but because that was technology moving from one format to a smaller format, you know, even as as early as seven years old, I understand that you know there's a big change on where that size is going. And then 2003 was what it was one of the highest peak. Uh, of the use of thumb drives. I remember in high school when I have a very small, lighter sized uh, USB with a whopping 128 MB <laughs> size uh, capacity and I can load pictures, I can store uh, 
uh, songs, and it was very nice. And I felt like a rich kid walking around with a thumb drive hung around my neck um, because I was one of the few kids that had it during the time. Um, and it just goes through that that small 50-year gap. You're coming from a, a closet-sized uh, uh, device, or rather um, equipment, down to a small lighter-sized device. And we have, here we have a picture of a, a supercomputer. Basically, the ASCII read uh, house in the Sandia Labs at the time. That's the whole computer, by the way. That whole room. Okay? It's about 150 square meters. It can compute at 1.3 teraflops. Um, and it cost $69 million to operate. That was just in 1997. Forward a little bit. We've got the upcoming Xboxes and PS5. No, this is not an ad for an Xbox. Uh, I just want to give you an idea that from 69 million for one teraflops, we're down to just 500, 600 dollars at 2.28 and 12 teraflops, which is 12 times the computing power in a small box, right? The size of your water of your water kettle where you boil water on a daily basis can have 12 times the maximum capacity comp uh, of computation versus that one one big room just what 23 years ago that was so short in, in that span of time and then I move on to AI AI and there's a lot of uh, and I think the misconception of AI is starting to is starting to uh, be a little bit more clear there was a huge change before when how AI was being perceived um, and with Microsoft, and because we are a Microsoft partner, so I'll, I'll, I'll leverage a little bit from what they are offering. Um, AI still needs to be taught. And there, that's where machine learning comes in. Uh, you need to feed it information. You need to give AI and get AI used to a lot of the different things that you're doing in order for it to provide you more accurate and more adaptive information. Starting from vision, from the faces to the different things that you feel, uh, certain apps and software allows you to understand these images and videos as, as you feed them. And it starts to learn what the patterns are. Also, there's speech. Uh, some of these applications that allows you to hear, an easy, an easy uh, version of that would be uh, your translator. Google Translate or any other application allows, you to, uh, allows it to uh, hear what you're saying and translate it into the other types of, uh, and, and, uh, in, and interpret it and Capture it as data first before it translates. So that moves us on to language. It's able to process, even though we all have our diction, we all have different nuances on the way that we say things. Um, AI needs to be able to capture the words and the languages that and the nuances, those those type the, those small intricacies in the way that you say, and, and be able to process that uh, and and store it as data and usable data, such as when that knowledge comes in. It cannot be just the type of the keystrokes. It cannot be just the information that you type in on your on your laptop or desktops or phones. Knowledge needs to be acquired horizontally. It needs to be able to compare what is usable knowledge and preferred knowledge all throughout through using various different types of searches. And then you've got, you know, with different searches, we're also tapping into not, uh, different types of uh, search engines and algorithms that access us to uh, allows us to take those information and then lastly applications of those by using emerging different types of lab activities where in it can be applied in a contained sandbox environment or then used for practical applications and you know within Microsoft side these are some of those applications that are readily available for you to use these resources are definitely accessible for you. If you need help with identifying some where, where some of these can be found, you let me know and I'll, I'll get you to the right person that can help you, right? So from vision to speech to language, knowledge, search, and labs. Different uh, projects. Some of those are actually pretty interesting. I, I, I suggest taking a look at that and just give them a go, get, get an idea on, how, on, on what those are, are uh, on what's happening there. So that's AI and we are, talking about current truths. Thomas Frey delivered a talk at TED uh, and says 2 billion jobs will disappear by 2030. And that caused both um, readiness and anxiety for a lot of people because 2030 is just around the corner. That's 10 years from now. It's not the future. It's not Jetson's days. It's just 10 years from now. 
but we've conducted our own, uh, well, not we, but Microsoft as a collective group has conducted their own studies. And basically, here's what we saw. It's not displacement. It's just transformation. 86% of those jobs will be transformed in the next three years. That's just right around the corner. Either those jobs will be outsourced or automated or made redundant. That When they're made redundant, that would mean that they will just be folded into something new. There is a replication of that role into something else. That's why it's being redundant. Uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that's why it's redundant. Um, the jobs now, 33%, will be retrained and upskilled to be able to do a lot more. And the new roles, just like what I mentioned a while ago, will start to come out. Um, and um, it will be available. About 26% of, of that whole pie will be new roles, new job titles, new investments into technology and um, uh, in medical fields, in biological, and, and so on. And then 14% will remain unchanged or as is. So that gives a better idea. So that's the job. Learning now has to change. And it is already changed, right? Gone are the days, oh, sorry, uh, platforms. Um, and the teachers, uh, rather, the, the platforms are becoming the teachers now. They're very much aware of this. Everyone just goes onto YouTube and tries to understand or capture whatever they're doing. It's an easy, you know, um, interface that pe allows people to just search up what they need to know about. Has no teachers, right? Has no teachers under their fold, their group of platformers and, and, and developers. You've got the largest classroom or lesson provider that has no classroom, Khan Academy, the largest a non-profit registered course provider has no registrar. You don't need to fall in line anymore in, in this platform. You just have to do a quick search and you can easily add into your cart and add into your curriculum all of the new courses that you want. The largest for-profit online certi certification provider has no accreditation. Why? Because they're a platform, they're a tech. They don't need to get accredited anywhere, right? But they are pro uh, pulling in different accredited vendors inside one household. And then, of course, um, and this one uh, affects more towards other countries, but there is a refinancing group, which is not a bank. Actually, here, um, there are other uh, financial services that are also non-banks, such as Gcash, basically provided by a, a telecoms provider. And they're one of the easiest way for us to transact services and money, especially nowadays. Very easy for me to transfer money from one location, from one person to another's account using that kind of platform. So what has that impacted? Well, it changes the way that uh, that educators such as yourselves are teaching. Um, gone are the days where in one plus one equals two, wherein there is an instructor or a teacher in front acting as a as a sage towards a group of users, and all they're doing is um, acquiring the information and then passing on along once they're out of the classroom. That's not the case anymore. Uh, now. Learning needs to be responsive and needs to be able to adapt at lightning speed, right? Uh, it's no longer a, a situation wherein the educator is the one just primarily talking as roles, as, as the teachers and as the educators. We need to activate students in order for them to collaborate on works, in order for them to switch on towards how they're going to be critically thinking about what they need to do and what they need to learn. You become facilitators of education instead. You're not only providing instructions, but anyone can easily pull up their phone while a teacher is talking or an edu educator is giving a lecture. Pull up their phone, do a quick search, and be able to see, okay, this is a couple of ways on how I can do that and pass it on to the next student or share it into a different crowd. And that's what we want to be able to do, right? It's no longer one plus one plus two. It's one plus one equals two, three, four, five, all at the same time. Information travels very quickly. Click of a, or rather, uh, in a snap, you've got the same information over a thousand people with just a small uh, post inside any of your uh, learning platforms. So instead of focusing on the content or all, only on delivering the content, we build essential life skills. We've got creativity, communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and computational thinking. So I'm going to fast forward this a little bit more. And you've seen probably the educational transformational net, uh, framework of Microsoft, but we're just going to focus on this area, teaching and learning for future ready skills, learning spaces, collaborative learning, and the learning management system. Traditionally, the architecture or the, 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 yeah, the architecture of learning of uh, solutions is focused on the core infrastructure around workflow agent, engines and productivity and collaboration tools. But what we need to drive towards is being able to capture 
data, be able to analyze it and automate it so that you can expand on the solution. So a lot of schools are still in this framework and it's okay, it works. But here's the different step into the maturity model. A lot of, uh, a lot of schools and uh, teachers are still on the gray area. You want, uh, you have on-prem siloed business apps, you've got desktop applications, you've got flat file data syncs, basically a way for you to be able to transfer uh, folders and uh, files in a, in a shared drive and a few others. You've got collaborative, collaboration tools and basic productivity. And this is where we want to get to. You've got mobile and automated workflows, integrated productivity applications, and unified collaboration tools, right? Microsoft offers a maturity model that allows you to get utilize a few of those different applications already. From Teams, which is what we're using now, Office 365, everyone has an access to it, and it's, uh, and it's also offered uh, at, at different price point for education, uh, actually it's for free for students. You've got Data Lake, Azure Containers, Power Platforms for you to be able to do apps in a day and be able to use functionalities that turns ideas into real working applications in just a few steps and Dynamics that allows you to do processes and helps you with different processes as you work on. Going into Power BI for digitized information Azure Bot Framework and Machine Learning Studio. So this is just a quick look at some of the technologies that is readily available for you at any time. If there's anything in particular that you're interested there, do let me know. I'll make sure that we get you the information uh, or I'll get, make sure that you, we get you connected and get you started on that part of your journey. And it is a journey. The journey, it's all individual. You are in various different stages. Some of you might be a little bit more mature in technology. Some of you might be a little bit, be, not behind, but still working your, your way through um, and, and identifying what your plan is. So there has to be a plan. And a plan starts with getting an idea of where you're at. And here is another tool that you can use in order for you to get an idea of what kind of, uh, or of where you're at, what the plan is, where you want to be and how to get there, right? There are, uh, Microsoft has built this institution assessment tool that allows you to be able to get a good idea of where you are in your journey and what footprint you're making. It gives you a guidance on how and what to do in order to get to the next step. Where you can find that is a site called edujourney.microsoft.com. It takes you to that, in, uh, it takes you to that assessment tool. It's right here. The framework that I showed you just a while ago is right there and you can build your strategies and plans along the way. Uh, and if this is something that you would want help on, then let me know and I will make sure that we get you the right people and it's called, of course, CloudSoup included as well. So let's move on to the actual tools. I've got a few tools that I can recommend to you guys that allows you to boost up a little bit more of what you're already doing. One of that is Flipgrid. Flipgrid allows you to do social learning. It's basically the flip classroom, but just in a mobile app. Students can share all of their ideas, their voices, their thoughts, and it can be shared in a, in a group that is not um, uh, singular, it's not one-to-one. -one. Um, all of them can then put out their voices. There are a few applications that they can use in order to enhance the social component, but basically it allows not just the students, but even their families to be involved into the learning. We're in this, the, the teacher now or the educator would bring forward uh, would bring forward a topic and that topic will be what would be driving the discussion and then input will be coming across the different students. Uh, it's available for free. You can download it. You can look up Flipgrid online uh, or flipgrid.com um, and you can get started in just five minutes and it's geared towards middle school and here are some of you engaging activities for middle school, high school, university and family learning uh, as an idea. <clears throat> Uh, something to start, especially during this, uh, this uh, situation that we have on ECQ. Put up a topic that goes about how does your family or what does your family do to keep productive uh, during ECQ? What are some of the tips and uh, uh, ideas that you can share for other people so that they can try, such as possibly they've tried baking or cooking or uh, they're, they're, they're learning new, new skill sets. So those are things that can get social, that, that can be socially engaging. Next, I have uh, another application. This is not a Microsoft application. I would try to be as, uh, as open as possible during this discussion. We have Deck Toys. I like this application because it allows you to gamify things. If you notice, there's like a map uh, on what you can do. 
and uh, I'll share the slides later. If you click on this look uh, on this link right here for their logo, you'd be able to uh, access a five minute quick look. But basically, you can gamify the words and it allows you to create uh, different types of learning decks in as in as quick as five minutes. You can set activity pathways. You can set uh, different games such as jigsaw puzzles or spin wheels, word wheels, or if you want to create different types of engaging um, activities. It can even allow you to do uh, synchronized learning by having all of the devices sync all at the same time. So you're looking at the same thing rather than some other users moving forward in the slides. Next, another tool that I'd like to promote is, uh, or to introduce to you guys, if you're not familiar yet, is Trello. Trello is a task manager, and it's the same actually board. You see, that's my team right there. This is the same board that they're using for one of the key area that they're use uh, that they're that they're focusing on. It allows us to be able to pull tasks, and this works if, for example, you're working on group projects, or uh, since everyone is uh, located elsewhere, it just kind of give kind of gives you an idea on where you're at already in the entire project, how you can break it into phases. You can also create multiple boards, just like what I have here, and. Uh, be able to allow stu uh, users to pick up any 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 specific areas that they work on or tasks that they want to work on. Other features that's available for that, you can do comments, you can upload from different drives, you can automate notifications, um, you can track activities, um, there are voting options and discussions, and you can assign various different tasks to specific users, right? And that's uh, easy task manager right there. And of course, we wouldn't be done if we're not talking about Teams. Um, instead of talking about what teams can do, here's just a few uh, I, uh, information that you can use to get, be, be, get, get to master teams a little bit more. So you've got the camera, minimize all the other applications, and also silent any possible distractions while you're starting the meet or before you start the meeting. Just during the meeting, you can record your audio, of course, share desktop, just like what we're doing, and do multitasking with teams. You can actually do other other applications on the side, but we're not going to touch on that since we're using the application now. After the meeting, all of the recording will be located in one uh, useful area, which is Microsoft Stream. You can have your you have your own folder for all your, all of your information, but at the same time, uh, you can be uh, made part of different groups or different uh, audio streams or re recordings. Transcriptions and speaker tracks are searchable if you enable it. Uh, and then there are more action items that can be uh, set on Teams. One of the things that I like, actually, just to highlight on that, is the ability for me to be able to change, I oh, can't do it right now, uh, but for me to be able to change the background. So instead of having people passing by in the background, you can blur or you can do different types of uh, nice different backgrounds to make it look like you're in a much more professional setting or even in a beach. And that helps because right now we're kind of uh, all required to be in front of the camera. So lastly, I'd like to talk about what's available to you so that we're uh, making good track of time. Uh, you also have uh, another tool. This one is coming from CloudSwift. If you go to dlsud.cloudswift.com, you can actually learn and upskill uh, on various areas such as data science, big data, AI, DevOps, modern IT, IoT, software development, data analysis, which is a general data useful for business, marketing, finance, uh, and a whole you know, whole line of different, uh, or actually, for the most part, it's a, it can be useful for almost all all uh, practices, all all, all uh, departments, cybersecurity, and any other. And we've got other specialized courses right there. This is ready and available. If you want to sign up and take on courses, just go into this site. All right. What do you gain out of that? Well, these are actually short courses with virtual hands-on labs. Here's a quick snapshot of what some of those courses would look like. Now, these courses are micro courses. They are about 20 to 30 hours long. There's a virtual hands-on lab that's available right there for you to be able to practice what you're learning inside a virtual machine. So it's not just flash-based activities, but really any application that you have, it will spin up uh, and render an, a, a unique uh, browser-based machine and it's just for you to be able to use any of that application. You don't have Power BI, that's fine. Click on the virtual lab, it will launch everything that you need, including the activities and the applications. You wanna learn about uh, Machine Learning Studio, same thing. Go into the lab, all of your Machine Learning Studios and, and Azure portals, uh, uh, account, rather uh, software and applications will be readily available as well as the activities. Once you're done with it, you get a digital badge when you're done. This is what that looks like. 
the digital badge would help uh, would be uh, would host uh, Microsoft, of course, Dasma as the partner uh, partner provider, and we've got CloudSwift logo right there. This is our service actually for the school, and it is available for you guys. Um, you take you get the certificate and you get the badge by scanning this QR code instead of having multiple certificates uh, all around the place, you can just scan the code and it will take you to uh, the whole list and it will show you everything, all of the other certificates that you've already uh, generated and completed, right? A few snapshots of that would be the view of the system, the view of the labs, and you've got that right there. And the labs do, looks just like this. You've got the lab activity right there. The whole application spins up. You don't need to download anything. You don't need to install anything. It's all readily available for you as soon as you click the button. And then this is the old uh, badge design. As you can see, it has been updated, but you can share it in your social media. So now you also have a way to kind of brag about, not, you know, it's not, it's just an additional way for you to brag about your accomplishments, I guess, on, so, on social media, but it does have a purpose. And lastly, we have our blended learning experience. One of the key factor about, um, about uh, online learning is that sometimes there's a disconnect, right? Uh, there's no direct one-to-one -one interaction with your students. Um, and this uh, blended learning, uh, platform that we're building, it will be available by May, allows you to schedule a one-on-one -on -one time. It can be an hour or two hours for not just the school that you're working on, but even other schools that is in the roster. This also enables you as educators to be um, to, to, to apply your knowledge for other students from different schools, maybe from uh, Singapore or from Malaysia or from Indonesia that might need help on a specific topic that you're an expert of. And the nice thing about it is that we're building this as a gig, gig economy where in um, the mentors or educators can actually make a little bit of incentive or honorarium out of the work. Um, so it does provide a, an extra level of uh, side income on your on your hours that are your free. If you're free on Saturdays and Sundays and you want to do mentoring, this can be done remotely via that platform. And these are just some of the use case studies about uh, of CloudSwift, just to kind of give you an idea that uh, as a fledgling company here in the Philippines, we're about five years old now, but we have traction across the whole of Southeast Asia, and that's why uh, we've got a lot of um, uh, experience in terms of um, higher education and remote learning as well. So we would like to help you out um, in, in your journey. If, it were, if it's the CloudSwift uh, platform that you're using, then great. If you need help on some of the other ones that I just introduced, do let me know. But I'd like to leave you with this. This is just a term. The future is already here, but it's just not evenly distributed. Every educator has different journeys. Every company has different steps. And we just have to uh, uh, identify what our plan is and be able to run towards that plan and put it as a goal. So that's it for me. I would leave it, leave it up for any questions. Uh, but thank you for the time and thank you for listening in. Uh, and I'm opening up myself for any questions at this time. Okay, so any questions? So Roland? No, uh, let's see. Uh, we have one question here, uh, as a chat, from Mom Corpus. I just want to ask if using the hands-on lab is for free. Okay. So the hands-on labs, we're talking about CloudSafe's hands-on labs. There is a minor uh, cost to just the labs alone. Um, and it is there is a cost. It starts at $19, which is about less than 1,000 pesos. It is, uh, and that's basically for the, the entirety of the sandbox. And uh, it comes together with the digital badge and certificate. You can liken it as a way for the same credentialing as an MOS or an MTA. So it's around that same range. Uh, and if you would want to uh, utilize that, there is a request lab functionality button right there. It goes directly to CloudSwift and we will provision it directly to the user. So the, the, the minimal cost, the minimum cost of that is at 19 years old. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Here's another. Sean from 
Rosario Reyes. I just want to find out more about Trello. Trello, Trello. Trello, uh, sir. Trello. Is the app for free? And yes. is there a way for us teachers to monitor the contribution of each member in a project? Yes, there is. So the app by itself um, is uh, is an, is open. You can download the app and send it to the users and add new users. As an educator, yes, you can track because there are logs within the uh, application. So the moment that the task is picked up and assigned, you're able to see that. Let me show you uh, our teams, give you an idea. And I think I'm okay to share some of these. Okay, so this is an example if you're able to screen now. I've, we've created different work streams, right? From backlog to in progress and so on. You can click on an item and be able to see and put in a different types of attachments. You can also see the activities of what's happening for the logs. That allows you to give an, get an idea of who's picked it up, who's working on it, what are some of the information that's available and so on. You can also change the backgrounds and the labels to some of the aesthetic aesthetic features of the system. Okay, those are all the activities. Yes, madam, does that answer the question? Yes, uh, okay, good. Okay. Any other questions? And, uh, okay, I have another question. Um, does does virtual hands-on labs support software and applications mostly used in generating multimedia, for example, Adobe Suite, Creative Cloud, or the Dev? Yes, sir. Actually, the labs are uh, function basically as a virtual machine, meaning that any update, any software update is automatic based on those applications. Or sometimes all you need to do is click the application that's inside and it will prompt you that there is an update to the application or to the software. It will run just like that. The idea of the labs is that you can actually use it for any device. I can be working on a lab here in my laptop, go inside and pick it up on my desktop and pick up right where I left off. Or if, for example, I need to go through the content, I can use my phone to view the content. So it transitions and the machine is readily available for you at any given time. No more download, no installation, no software. It looks like this. And let me try to see if I can get into uh, a test environment. So while we're launching that, um, yeah, aut uh, automatic updates, yes. Any software, yes. We can even customize labs for you. For example, um, th these courses already come with specific templates. And they're already um, they're already included with all of the activity because they're tied in towards the requirement of the course. However, let's say for example, we're um, with with uh, De La Salles, uh, De La Salles University. If you're using the same course as a standard across different uh, departments or maybe even across different teachers, um, we can modify the courses and the labs so that they're only the activities and the there are different differences on a granular level, such as the teacher. Uh, a teacher wants to use, let's say, different data sets. We can use that and upload that into a lab. The teacher prefers to use an additional software application apart from what is readily given. We can also do that and create the lab for you. So those are all uh, the, the functional benefits of the, of the hands-on labs. Basically, if you didn't see what I did, I went inside the course. The content of the course is right here. There are different types. Some of them are um, text videos content. Some of them are exercises. You've got your knowledge checks. And then there's the hands-on lab that automatically takes you. Once you click launch lab, it will take you to your lab set. Oops. All right, I guess. Sorry, this is a this is a test environment. They're probably working on something, um, but here's stuff how that's supposed to look like. <laughs> Why is that broken? So, as an educator, you've got your dashboard. You can view lab consumptions of your own students. 
Let me see if there's one that we have here. Ah, uh, here. So I've got Philip, who's logged in about four hours of lab time already, and you can see how much he still has left. You can take a look at different lab activities. You can do grading. So as a teacher, you can remotely see the progress of your students. Um, basically, we call that lab remote assist. And uh, or lab remote access and the teacher or the student would be able to access uh, the machine of the of the user and be able to see what's happening with their profile. This is what that machine looks like. So let me use a canned recording because we're streaming at the same time. Probably my my uh, bandwidth is uh, currently, you know, having difficulty already. But you click on start lab session. The VM will pop up. All of your activity will show and all of these applications readily available. We can add new activities or we can make changes as is required by the teacher. So you can have the same lab across two, three different uh, teachers, but have different content inside and we can customize that that way. So there's the launch of the, of the Power BI application. So you can grade students uh, if they pass or fail or they need more work on their activities. And you can also view their labs remotely as, a, as an instructor. This basically mimics the idea of you uh, inside a, a computer lab. And rather than looking and peering over the, the student's machine, you're just diving directly into his machine. And it can be done at any given time by, this, by, this, by, the, uh, by the educator, by the teacher. OK. Um, any further questions? Did that answer my, uh, the question a while ago? No. Yes, sir. Uh, follow up. Uh, how about the license? Uh, yung license, sa inyo or from uh, sa school? Okay. So if it is a third party, meaning it's a non Microsoft uh, software, uh, usually uh, it's BYOL. It's a school, kung may license ta kayo. The nice thing about here, naman, sir, is that. Since the machine is basically a virtual machine, once the, the once the machine closes, that license becomes transferable. Um, it just depends on the on the license provider, but most of the time it's transferable. Uh, for Microsoft, uh, naman, uh, all of the licenses are built in, so okay. it's ready ready and good to go. Okay, and uh, sir, uh, I I remember you mentioned because uh, itong mga uh, software I kailang pa i download. Pero dito no need to download diba? and it will not take up any space in my laptop, for example. No, absolutely none. And that's also the 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 nice thing about the system is that this is all browser based. This is all browser based. Uh, we have we have um, Everything all set up. It just you going into. Akalang lang natin is uh, internet connection. Really, everything is already set up. Yeah, that's good. Uh, at the yung look nya, and you're doing grading. Let me use static for the meantime. But definitely, if you'd like to know more, uh, we can do an actual demo. Okay, so this is a uh, features and benefits uh, slides that I usually send. So you notice you've got lab grade right there. Drops down for the remarks. Individuals or uh, students would need to submit either images or uh, files that they send, uh, and that goes into a, a, a built-in Dropbox, and then users can or uh, uh, instructors, educators can click uh, remote lab and uh, basically it will uh, take over the machine of the user so that this, the, the professor can take a look at the, at the progress. And then once you're done, gives back the control to the user, right? Here's a quick look of that. If you click on the student submission, there's a timestamp, right? And you're able to see their output regardless where you're at. You can even use your phone to do it. And then when 
you're connecting directly to the lab. Basically, you're setting up the machine and opening the machine for yourself. Every every teacher has a maximum of two hours to access a student's machine. So we think that's ample time in order to do any grading or any correction or any any fine excuse me fine tuning for the student's lab. And then you can grade it. It's pass, fail, or ungraded. And that is the trigger for them to be able to get their certificate and badges. The badges, basically, it's a hands-on lab accomplished badge. So you know, what, that's actually what's uh, included with, uh, with the lab itself. When you finish the lab and you finish the course content component, um, you'll earn the, the digital certificate and the badge. All of this available online. OK. Thank you, sir. Um, here's another question from Alice Valerio. How far have we gone with AI in, in the Philippines? Interesting question. Some of that information is not readily available into the industry unless it's been released. However, some of the actual applications that I've seen is uh, there are groups uh, working on um, machine learning, of course, for the virus. You've probably seen the data sets, but that is actually triggered on, on uh, a, a feature under AI, which is machine learning and for, for data. In terms of automation, a, lots of, a, a lot of uh, companies are already introducing AIs and processes in order to improve their, 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 their production line. Um, identifying errors in production, identif using uh, different kinds of algorithms in order to uh, predict uh, time frames, logistics. Um, I know of a particular project with the manufacturing. I'm not uh, with a food production. I'm not allowed to say yet, but they're also using AI as a way to be able to respond to uh, emergencies um, lightning fast. So that's a that's a it's a research lab that is uh, that that is uh, in in the medical industry. What they have is um, they're identifying um, potential threats in areas, uh, and they're using AI to be able to capture uh, possible um, heat maps, locations. Uh, I'm not sure how much of this information I'm allowed to say. Uh, heat maps, <laughs> locations. Uh, potential threats, areas of coverage, and be able to respond by send uh, by by alerting different government groups. So that's uh, that's on an emergency responder uh, application or uh, of AI. So I don't know if I really answered that question right. <laughs> that's, that's, very, that's very good, sir. Uh, we have we have seen AI in the business applications, in medicine, in companies, right? Uh, how is it applicable applicable in the higher education in the Philippines, given that we are a bit laid back relative to neighboring countries? That's nice. Um, you know the thing about educating, and, and that that's a that's a perception that we're 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 laid back uh, in technology into teaching. But we've seen a lot of different schools uh, that have made larger thrust into into AI. I know of a school that is located in actually in um, Cagayan de Oro and there's a team there <clears throat> in a higher education um, that is developing smart traffic and the way that they're using it is they're utilizing Raspberry Pis, you know, those small microcomputers as a way to be able to trigger traffic based on um, uh, on distances. So what they're doing is they're not looking at the whole neural network uh, of traffic, but rather they're just looking one step ahead from this traffic light up to the next traffic light, and that creates a grid system. And they're using AI as a way to identify how much of that traffic is really heavy. If you uh, if you notice, a lot of times traffic lights are still are still very static, um, and they would st they would be on go for empty empty streets. But you know, there's a whole line backed up on another. So that small Raspberry Pi unit that is being developed by students um, utilizing very basic functionalities is measuring basically distances and communicating from one traffic light to the other traffic light in that grid lock or, or in that grid system. And it's being uh, tested already uh, in their city. So that's one way. Um, there are, I've seen also another um, school that is focusing on AI as a on, on how it uh, aligns with uh, AI and robotics. So that's a better application of that, or a more easier 
uh, connection of those two applications and how they do robotics process automation. Um, we have to get to a point where in we're no longer saying that the Philippines is behind. We've got some of the best educators in the Philippines and a lot of the applications that are being developed on an international level are actually coming from Filipinos. Those those students are products of you guys as educators. Some of them might even have gone to school and you were they were your teachers. So we need to take a look at what we can do in order to elevate um, the status and remove the stigma that we're, we're too relaxed um, and that we're behind. Because the information, especially this, if you notice, the information is, is right there. Teaching it to the students is what we need to do. Um, and uh, I wouldn't say we're laid back. I would say that we are catching up. And, you know, in a year, 12 months, 24 months, we'll get there. Uh, and this is why we're having these sessions, right? So that you'd be able to make use, better use of, of these technolo technologies to teach students. Right. <laughs> right. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, there's another question from Mr. Benavente. Uh, this is with regard to the laptop specs. Yes, like, sir. Uh, what specs should we be using, or what laptop specs should be should we we be using to be able to go from one browser to another, especially when we're when we're using this kind of platform? Uh, you don't, sir. That's the beauty of it. We're not restricted by your devices. A user who is running a very uh, mid-end or high-end laptop, really nice laptop, versus a student who is only using his phone will have the same computing power when the, once they're inside the lab. If the lab re requires at least a minimum of um, 8 gig RAM and 500 gigs of uh, storage space uh, and a GPU capacity to, for it to be able to render uh, different uh, multimedia applications, it doesn't matter if you're using an older desktop since this is all browser-based. You can even be using Autodesk or PowerPoint on a small tablet with a Bluetooth controller uh, that's, uh, that's hooked up to that tablet. Granted, that's not going to be very comfortable because you're looking at a small screen, but it will work, right? You can access mm -hmm. the app on any device. We're not, we're not bogged down by whatever hardware you have existing. Um, that's the beauty of the virtual labs. Uh, if it requires high-spec machines, it will deliver high-spec machines. Two separate tabs will have two separate specs and it's that's perfectly fine. Wow, that's good to know. So I don't have to buy a new laptop for that. No, sir, you <laughs> can even buy uh, the uh, a refurbished uh, device na even sa and running on a on a Celeron or Atom or uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, something that's less than 5000 pesos as a as a desktop hook up a a, a, a nice monitor and the lab will run. So <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah, we want to okay. be able to make this available for all students. Eh? The idea, sir, is that some of our students might not have access to the same devices that we have. So that's the idea behind the labs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, here's another question. Is there a hands-on lab for hospitality program like FNB or front office, etc.? Hospitality program. Ah. You know what? That's a really good idea. Um, whoever asked that question, if you're willing to work with us on creating a lab, if you already have the template, we'll, we'll create the machine for you. Um, and Sir Roland, I'm interested to know who asked the question. Uh, we can create... Uh, the labs yeah. are actually CloudSwift's product. And um, we can virtualize any machine and put in any application and build in any of these lab activities that you see here. Um, using your own uh, information. So if you already have uh, standalone PDFs, Word documents, or even um, activities that are all present inside your own LMS and you want to turn it into a virtual lab, we can take that and it will take us a day or two in order to come up with a brand new lab for you. We created one for uh, multimedia for uh, another school here. I'm not, I'm not allowed to say who. But what they have is they are on film, um, film, multimedia, digital media, and AR. So that's what they needed. <clears throat> and they needed to be able to give students the access to the machines even when they're at home. Um, on, in, in campus, they're using very high-end devices. They're using Macs. They're using um, 
very nice uh, Windows uh, devices, but when they're at home, they can't really do the work. By utilizing their custom-built lab for the multimedia application, they're able to take their lab work home um, and be able to complete uh, con continue the work. So, and and I'd be interested in how what we can do for the hospitality. Mm, yeah, uh, she Girl. mentioned a program like Front Office. Is that a software, or uh, yes, about um, applications that are front office applications? Yeah, no, no. The the name is uh, is Front Office. I think it's a program or a hands on lab or something. Let me take a look, sir. I'm not familiar. Uh, front Office. F and V also. Okay, when I look up front office, that uh, that what I'm getting is basically an image of a front office. So okay, can you send that on the chat, sir? <laughs> what what is the? Do they have a website? I don't know. Maybe uh, Mom Pierre, maybe you can uh, elaborate. I think it's a CTHM too. This application, front office. Front office. Front office management, that's an app on Google Play. That's what I'm seeing. I'm not sure if that's the right one. Management in the hotel industry. Oh, okay. Yes, uh, yeah, uh, like that, that one, hospitality okay. programs. All right, uh, this is an app that's available on, on Google Play. Um, we can virtualize a machine so that it can have this application installed in a device, but um, what exactly do we want to be able to do in this application, sir? So that I'm a little bit more I know, um, specific, because what I'm seeing, it has uh, terminologies, accounting, different types of offices that's available. Digital teaches the basic terms related to the front office department of the hotel. Mm. Okay, uh, balikan na lang natin to, sir. Um, yes, sir. No problem. Out, sir. I, I, na lang na. <laughs> I'd be interested to know. Um, yeah. Even we can virtualize and create labs for even non-Microsoft applications. In fact, we're creating one, a new library that we have upcoming, which will be available to you as well, by the way, is uh, courses under Future Learn. Uh, so Future Learn is another massive open online uh, courseware provider, very similar to Coursera and um, Khan Academy. Uh, and uh, they are based out of the UK. They will be available in your library, uh, hopefully by, by mid-June. We're already underway in developing the course content and integrating the content. Uh, so that gives you an idea that we can turn virtual labs, not just from Microsoft, but any application. We just need to know the scope. Okay. Good. Thank you, sir. Uh, here's another question from oh, from the scientist, from Mom Imelda Galera. Can you suggest applications or softwares that could primarily address the actual science lab experiments skills, like general chem, organic chem, biochem, etc.? Ah, I did see a couple of courses. Uh, it's it's from a site called Hippocampus. Let me look it up. Okay. So for the sciences, maybe this is a site that you can use. This is hippocampus.org. They've got Calculus, biology, chemistry, physics, earth sciences, sociology, and so on. Let's go look at chemistry. So you've got organic chemistry, simulations, air, electron configurations, valence, <laughs> periodic mm. tables, and so on. At the same time, our own course builder do does have. Um, let me show you that.
So the content from Hipp Hippocampus is free. This is an online organization, so you might want to be able to use that. If you want to take content from here and you want to build a course out of it or, or take multiple courses, since this is free material, you can use our studio in order to build new content. So let me create a new course. So here from Hippocampus, you'd see some of the content. These, I, I believe a few of those, a lot of those are actually video content that you can use as reference material. Uh, science sample. Uh, and let's say, for example, this is the LSUD uh, sample one. So the tool that I'm showing you right now is our uh, is our content builder. It's our studio. And you can take the content from the videos here from Hippocampus. You can get the sources, right? You notice it's actually that's providing. Uh, content. <laughs> Let's look at other content. By the way, you can use a uh, feature that's not on the board. It's to do a word. If not familiar with that, and So we use that. You can take that video link. Uh, video, click edit, click save. Ah, that's weird. I'll take a look at why. Oh, because I have to accept the terms and conditions. So there was a terms, con terms and condition page that I need to get to first before they would allow me that. Uh, but yeah, they, uh, you can use this and you can use problems such as um, drag and drops, image mapped output. You know, if we have like a, an image that has a that has a specific area that they can click, math expression outputs, molecular structure. These are some of the functionalities of our studio. And as sources, videos, content source, this is one uh, content that I can recommend. And hopefully that answered the question. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you so much. Because ngayong quarantine, one of our concerns is really labs, laboratory and use. Yes, so sir. We're glad to know that we can do this online, din pala. So the labs is yes, we can. Um, the platform, sir, as I said, the site is already with you. We can customize labs for um for specific uh users if they want. Uh, cu uh, custom labs, or we can use the readily available labs from the courses. So majority, about 70% of the course content found on your site already has labs in them. So we can just make use of that. So we can use the resources na available. Yeah. 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 And actually, the college had uh, had a chance to use the content already. We had about, um, sila mom, um, Vicky had a, had a had experiences on using the content. Well, lang yun labs because they were still using they, they the students were using the manual labs from the lab center. The virtual labs basically is the answer to that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Any other questions, Bob? Ato sir. Um, how much? <laughs> uh, how how much do we have to pay if we use uh, Cloud Suite subscription, but sir? Uh, sir, since we have this site for you, um, the actually uh, the co the cost of a lab and a course and the hands-on lab, uh, or rather the digital badges and credentials, like I mentioned, is only nineteen dollars starting point. Yun yung, um, that gives you access to thirty days of the lab, um, and uh, meron yung different tiers depending if we're going for semestral access or ano, and, and that's that's easy. But it starts at nineteen. 
uh, which is which roughly translate to about 950 pesos per u- per user. So very accessible naman siya. And at the end of it, like I said, it does give you something tangible um, once you've completed the courses, which is this. Ito yung, uh, yung uh, certificate and the badges that is uh, industry uh, applicable or is uh, industry sought actually. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a real benefit for our students. Imagine if nasa, cl- nasa classes pa lang sila, if they're able to acquire six to eight of these uh, these uh, badges, let's say, for example, for data science, then they can already begin their career and be much more noticeable, all the more, uh, in the industry uh, because they are coming from, uh, they, they can show proof that they did go through Microsoft content for data science. Um, and the price, I, as I said, it starts at $19, um, and we can easily come up with packages for different schools. So very, it's, uh, in comparison, once you go into corporate learning, right, uh, if you're taking training from, uh, from the industry, a standard Excel course can run you anywhere between seven to 9,000 pesos. This one is uh, much more. It's about the same cost as, a, as an MOS MTA course. Although the content is a little bit more industry specific or industry geared, mm-hmm. so hopefully we'll get a lot. Of, we'll get uh, people accessing labs and getting digital credentials from the audience. Yes, sir. Uh, okay, my interesting question: culinary lab, sir. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, before we we found that interesting as well, and and we were kind of joking about it until it happened. We're working with Enderun, so Enderun is a, one of our uh, uh, one of our partners, um, and we are it, we are considering um, putting up culinary, like for example, gastronomy, for in particular, you mga data about food, food sciences. Uh, yes, we can do that, and we can build that. Of course, hindi ko pwedeng sabihin kasi secret nila yung material nila onto their uh, uh, on on their courses. Uh, pero yes, we can do that. Depende po kung ano po kailangan. Ah, okay. So we can request for you to create our lab for us. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. The applications, yes. Ang kailangan lang namin malaman is the activities. Kasi definitely hindi 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 pa rin manggaling sa amin yun. Wala kami experience. Pero if, like for example, if you give us the instructions ng kung ano kailangan mangyari or ano yung mga exercises, we can digitize and and make the applications available and ready. So that is a custom lab. Mm, I see. And then uh, videos must uh, the videos must come from the professors. Uh, yes, if we're creating courses, not just labs, but if there is course content, if you already have the available material, um, it's very easy to turn them into a course. So like I, sh- uh, I was showing you a while ago, uh, through the studio, we can create new courses of um, just like data, different sources, different information. Let's create a course, let's put, um, let's put uh, activities and uh, module questionnaires, and then let's create a lab, and you've got a very... Uh, nice automated uh, lab and course for culinary. So we can work with you on how we can do that. Yeah, okay. So shout out uh, Professor Martins, <laughs> HRM. Yeah, so pwede, pwede. If I may, um, kung, uh, if, if you can voice it out lang po, kung sino interested on the culinary and the uh, HR content, I'd like to have another side discussion. Siguro po, pag-usapan natin ano yung mga requirements na gusto nyo makita, what, we're, what we want to enable para sa students for distance learning, and then we can see how that works. Yes, sir. Uh, we will connect them with you, sir. Sige po, sir. Thank you. Uh, any other questions po? Uh, let me see. Now, uh, going back to the front office application, it's hotel front office management. So, para siyang uh, simulation for like check-in, check-out procedure. So, from the time of reservation. Um, all I'm seeing po is the one from, uh, is an app on Google Play. Uh, there is hotel ho- hotel logics. Is that the one? Uh, 
its front office of hotels, food, and beverage laboratory. Um, so my question to Gurupo, uh, just to get an, uh, an idea on how it works, it's a full software on um, on Yunya Pag, Pag reservations and then bookings and uh, all others, like for example, meron ba mga simulation done, like how to mix drinks, how to prepare uh, a checklist, mga ganon, meron ba? Features like that. Sorry, hindi ako familiar eh. Pero let's see what this one looks like. Let's see. Uh, Sir Paul, pakit kulong naman. <laughs> ano ba tong front office management? If it's a software, then definitely we can virtualize it. We can put it in the lab and uh, we can create activities around it that triggers the software inside. If the requirement is kasi dahil yung software medyo tech heavy at uh, nahihirapan ng mga students para to run the, the, the software or install the software in their home devices, then yes, we can do that. Um, if, and also, even if, for example, if meron siyang, um, uh, if, uh, if the limitation that we have, our students don't have access to, to uh, laptops and desktops, phones lang, then we can make it happen. So that's... Uh, that's what I think we can do from the very beginning until we get a better idea of what we need. See, I don't know the logic. I feel like I'm going to be a lot of YouTube and Netflix and network. There are a lot of people interested in the lab because of the quarantine. And then, may isang tanong from Sayat Engineering. To. Uh, how about engineering laboratory where performance measurement are determined? Are there virtual experimental setup for this? So for engineering software, sorry, sir, go ahead. Yeah, you know, uh, about engineering laboratories. Okay, so there is not a huge leap from engineering software to um, technology software. The requirements in terms of computing capacity and rendering are pretty much similar. So the quick answer is yes, we can launch softwares uh, that requires, like for example, AutoCAD, Autodesk, um, any other engineering uh, software uh, that's required. Um, the best way for us to identify if, if can we run it or not would be for us to get an idea of what software you're using and what kinds of activities you're doing. And from there, we can we we can uh, say na okay, so integrate that into. We can also use APIs from other. If for example, if there are any engineering uh, simulations that are readily available, we can virtualize the machine and then integrate uh, integrate any APIs needed for the activities. Um, so we don't have one readily available unless you would consider uh, design thinking. Hold on, I do have that here. So we have introduction to design thinking. We have robotics process automation, design and development, um, and designing a technical solution. These are some courses that might align with an engineering mind frame. Um, but if again, if you need the labs, we need to we need to be able to scope out what lab, what what software is is required. From a processing and a compute uh, perspective, wala po tayong problema. We can virtualize even up to let's say, for example. Uh, the same computing power as a server, uh, if necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, siguro last na to na question. Uh, how and when can we start to register or start using Cloud Swift? Virtual ah. apps, yeah. So the fastest way would be for you to just go into dlsud.cloudswift.com and be able to browse the courses, um, sign up and register. You can register here. And basically, there will be an activation from Cloudswift side. Our support team will be activating your account. And from there, uh, you can browse all of the courses and you can request access to that account. 
So maybe Sir Roland, as a as a way, what I can do is also to give you visibility from here. I can enable you as a as a staff access for users, um, and uh, you can invite other participants here if they want to go in the course. Because by invitation, po ang courses natin. So let's say, for example, let me sign in. Who's Josephine Eduardo? Okay, so I'm signing in as a student access. That's my course that I have assigned to me. Now, if you're here, and let's say, for example, you want to learn about AI, you select the course that you want, click Learn More, and then from there, you can enroll. And these are the information that you have available. Now, um, one thing about it here, though, is that um, we have enabled uh, open enrollment as of this time. We will be switching it out to, by invitation only so that we're able to better track users that is accessing the, uh, or requesting access to the course. So um, once it becomes by invitation only, all you need to do would be to send me an email or possibly sir, send uh, Mam Dang or Sir Roland a, a quick email saying that you want to enroll into the course in order for you to have access to that course. And then so that we can also uh, provision the labs if needed. Okay? Okay. Okay, so thank you, sir. All right. So thank you very much for your time, everyone. If there are any following uh, questions, you can reach me. Um, my email is prince at, uh, prince at com. I think I have it in my slides. If not, I will just type it right there. Uh, no, it's not in my slide. So I'll just insert here so that everyone has it. So it's an uh, email. It's Prince. I can't even spell my own name. At cloudswift.com. And uh, my mobile is uh, 0905-374-2094. I'm much more faster to respond on mobile. If you want, add me up on Viber, on WhatsApp, and dun po ako. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for your time. And then I will connect with you directly, Sir Roland. If you don't mind, just uh, pinging me any questions that might go further or connect me to some of the other people. But thank you for your time this morning and uh, uh, have a good day. <laughs>